Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Wesley United Methodist Church. In just a moment, our chancel choir is going to be singing for you. But we have two services going on today. Some of our folks are across the hall for our Japanese language service. And our senior pastor, Reverend John, is giving the message there and being translated for the folks who are listening in Japanese. And I'll be speaking today here. But we have some of our choir members who are going to be part of the Nichigo service. So we're doing our anthem first so that they can go over there. We invite you to be thinking about next Sunday. Next Sunday will be our I Remember You service, where we remember people that we have lost, not just in the last year, but in recent times, because this will be the first time that we've been able to do that service since the pandemic. And I know that all of us have feelings of loss and things about that. And our Stephen ministers will be on hand, and they're sponsoring that part of the service. Then we also have our trunk and treat the following day, the 31st. That'll be in our parking lot. Kids from the neighborhood coming in to trick or treat uh, here at, at Wesley Church. And just one final reminder, I hope all of you have parking permits because there is always a little confusion about who should be parking in our parking lots. Just ask that you do make sure that your parking permit is out and visible because we're just trying to make sure that those places are reserved for people who should be there. Because lots of people are coming to Japantown on Sundays, and we want to make sure you folks have a good place to park. So, welcome to our worship service. We are glad that you are here. Now, enjoy as our choir leads us into worship.
Good morning. I'd like to invite you to please stand if you are able and join me in the call to worship. We come before you and all of you and what you have made. We too often think that we humans are in charge. Let us come before our God in an attitude of humility and appreciation. Thanks be to God who made us and walks with us even through the most turbulent times. Amen. God of faithful surprises, through the ages you have, you have made known your love and power in unexpected ways and places. May we daily perceive the joy and wonder of your abiding presence and offer our lives in gratitude for our redemption. Amen. Let us join in singing God of Wonders. Oh. 
for this next song, Uncontained, it may be unfamiliar to some. So Dave and I will do a quick run through here. There are two choruses. The first chorus is straightforward, and we'll just sing uh, this uncontained. Thank you. One, two, three, four. One, two. Uncontained. Bursting out, never contained. Breaking out, every chain. Far beyond our human domain. You remain uncontained. And as uh, Dave was demonstrating, uh, there's this call and response. So, um, if um, I don't know if it's possible to scroll through to the slides. If not, it'll be uncontained and then bursting out, bursting never out. detained. So let's try that again. <clears throat> one, two, three, four, one. Uncontained. Bursting out, never detained. Breaking through every chain. Far beyond our human domain. But you come to knock the walls down, roll the stone away. Far beyond what we could ask or imagine, but we could entertain. Lord, we try to make you small, but you cannot be contained. Bursting out, never detained. down, make you stay the same, but you come to knock the walls down, roll the stone away, far beyond our left or imagine, but we could entertain, Lord, we try to make you small, but you cannot be contained, first Please be seated. Hear the gospel message from Joel, chapter 2, verses 23 to 32. O children of Zion, be glad and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the later rain, as before. The threshing floor shall be full of grain. The vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will repay you for the years that the swarming lotus has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army, which I sent against you. You shall, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I, the Lord, am your God, and there is no other. And my people shall never again be put to shame. Then afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. 
Even on the male and female slaves in those days, I will pour out my spirit. I will show portents in, he in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the mood to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. All right, thank you, Jim. Always worried about getting tangled up in these, all these cords that I have to wear and taking your mask off and having glasses and hearing aids and the titanium thing in my neck, everything like that. Do our best here as we go. So as you may know, I come from farmers. I've talked before about my great-grandparents on my mother's side, Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe who ran a dairy farm just outside Turlock in California's Central Valley. The Newmans put their five sons through college, including my grandfather, Charlie, who went to what is now UC Davis to study agriculture, and he became an ag teacher in his career. Later, when my grandpa Charlie remarried, he and Grandma Peggy had an orange orchard in Ojai. And my grandparents on my father's side, Boyd and Sybil Teagle, homesteaded 70 acres near McClary, Washington, just west of Olympia. I'm sure you've all been to McClary. <laughs> Not a big touristy spot. They carved farmland out of the woods there from hay fields with an orchard with many varieties of apples, cherries, plums. Farming supplemented my grandpa's principal income as a planer at the Simpson door plant there. And even now, if you buy a solid core door, it may have been made in McClary, Washington. Later on, as I was growing up, I, we, our family had a small farm near Port Townsend, Washington. I'm giving you this whole travelogue of the entire West Coast. Um, we had beef, cattle, a small orchard, pigs, chickens, two horses, and a donkey. We also grew hay on some of our land and harvested hay on other people's land. My brother and I had chores every morning before school and chores when we got home from school. Summers were spent mowing, raking, and baling hay, then hauling it to the barn or selling it to other farmers. I spent many hours on a tractor just like this, International Farm All Cub. Yeah. And I know that a lot of you have parents and grandparents who are farmers or nursery workers or toiled in packing plants. For a lot of us, agriculture is in our blood. I can tell you one thing from this. There is an anxiety to being a farmer. You rely on there being enough rain or enough irrigation, the weather not being too hot or too cold. You worry about insects or disease affecting your crops. If your crop gets wiped out, you could lose your farm. You could be in financial ruin, just like that. In the hay business, our main worry was to time your mowing so that the hay would not get rained on after it was mowed and before it was baled and put away. That meant mold and a ruined hay crop. But the challenge of finding a string of days without rain in Western Washington is no small feat. Tragically, the family farm is largely, largely becoming a thing of the past. Large corporations now run most of the farms in this country. They've been buying up the small and even the large farms, finding a time when the farmers are most vulnerable economically. It's harder and harder for people to make a living. That's why we have so many former farmers in this room and not many farmers. That and the fact that the Valley of the Heart's Delight is now just the homes of Silicon Valley workers. But that loss of the, the family farm, to me that's one of the great tragedies of the 20th century. Now from today's scripture reading from the First Testament, or the Old Testament as many people call it, 
the people were farmers as well. Their fortunes were tied to the land. It gave them security. It fed them. It gave them something to pass on to their children. They depended on the land. So when the prophet Joel talks about the devastation left by a locust swarm, it's a big deal. You see all the locusts in that picture? Just a few. He describes the locusts coming through as a teeming army. This is how the book of Joel starts, chapter 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Pethuel. Hear this, O elders. Give ear, all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? Tell your children of it, and let your children tell their children and their children another generation. What the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. Wake up, you drunkards, and weep, and wail, all you wine drinkers, over the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has inv invaded my land, powerful and innumerable. Its teeth are lion's teeth, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vines and splintered my fig trees. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it down. Their branches have turned white. Just another cheery reading from the Old Testament, right? So chapter 2 of Joel goes on to describe the locust invasion, comparing them to horses and chariots and war horses. There's some debate among scholars as to whether or not Joel is describing an actual army of soldiers or whether the locusts are just maybe an allegory for that uh, military invasion. In the end, it doesn't matter whether it's an army or locusts, it's absolute destruction. We're also not sure what time period Joel was from. There aren't any time-specific events referred to in the book to place them in history. His oracles are aimed at Judah and Jerusalem, but his message really is timeless. Even in today's world, we deal with swarms of literal locusts and other stations in some places. Locust swarms covered much of Western Africa from 2003 to 2005. There was damage to crops estimated at $2.5 billion. And in those small economies, that's an awful lot. Locusts have not been seen in North America of late, but in the 1930s, they were one of the causes of the Dust Bowl in Oklahoma in the Central Plains. In 1875, there was a swarm of Rocky Mountain locusts that covered 198,000 square miles, which is bigger than the state of California, with more than 12.5 trillion insects. I'm not sure who counted all of those insects. I suspect that might just be an estimate. But nowadays, scientists are better at tracking the potential swarms, working to eradicate them before they get started. Did you know that locusts are really just grasshoppers? Lots and lots and lots of grasshoppers. But because of the conditions that are around them, they take on this swarming phase. If there's a period of drought followed by a whole bunch of rain, all that new growth comes up, and something in the grasshoppers triggers the swarming phase. They eat more, they breed more, there can be billions of locusts swarming and destroying much of the vegetation. And you can imagine the noise made by billions or trillions of insects. I was in North Carolina last year at the height of the cicada swarm. The noise was everywhere. You had to like go in, close all the doors and windows just to have some peace and quiet. But I'm told that's nothing compared to the sound of locusts. Now, this kind of devastation is not limited to locusts, right? Fresh in our minds is the damage left in the wake of Hurricane Ian in Florida. The powerful winds, rains, the storm surge wiped out a big part of that area. 
other parts of the southeast. This was seeded by Hurricane Fiona in Puerto Rico, and then just so many others. We also see whole towns struck by tornadoes. Or closer to home, we see the overwhelming effect of wildfires and earthquakes. I'm sure many of you remember the widespread damage from the 1989 Loma, Loma Prieto earthquake, from the collapse of the eight viaduct, the section of the Bay Bridge that failed, the fires in San, San Francisco's Marina District, the World Series delayed structural concerns at Candlestick Park and other damage locally. Of course, the, the real tragedy was that the Giants lost to the A's in that World Series. Uh, I'm a little partial on that way. Um, I do have friends that tragically lost their homes in both Santa Rosa and Paradise in those recent fires. Wipes them out. In the aftermath of these disasters, towns look like war zones. And in today's world, we don't have to look very far to see that as well. When I see the pictures and the video footage from Ukraine, it just breaks my heart that people are having to go through this. So last week at our Wesley movie discussion group, we talked about the movie The Little Red Wagon. And uh, Ron Ogie was our, our leader for that. It was set in 2004 in Tampa, Florida, in the aftermath of another hurricane there. There was an eight-year-old boy named Zach Bonner who was collecting donations from his neighborhood for the displaced people. And he put them in his little red wagon, because when you're eight, that's the best transportation you have. And ultimately, he ended up as an eight-year-old starting a nonprofit to help homeless kids. And to call attention to the plight and the issue, he walked from Tampa to Tallahassee, which is the, the state capital in Florida, 180 miles, just to bring attention to that cause. And it was just very timely and a very poignant film to look at what ordinary people can do to help those people around them. What all these calamities have in common is that those affected will have to start over. The disaster obliterates everything they have or close to it. And that's not an easy thing to deal with, to say the least. Have you had a time in your life when you've had to start over? Maybe the loss of a job, the loss of a business, loss of a relationship, a health crisis, my son Aaron spent the second week of his life in the neonatal intensive care unit at Children's Hospital of Orange County. He had a systemic infection, a high fever. Seeing this tiny newborn baby with multiple IVs and leads hook up to him, not knowing what the future would hold, that was really hard. And it's hard to remember that now that he's a 35-year-old, six-foot-tall high school teacher. But God through that time. But I know that so many of us have been through times like this, or maybe multiple times like this in our lives. Ancient peoples, including the Hebrews, saw God's hand in these natural disasters. If the locusts struck, it was God's judgment on them for straying from their covenant. Storms, earthquakes, hostile invasions are listed as means for God getting people's attention. And sometimes it worked. The prophets would call for repentance, for mourning in sackcloth and ashes, and the people would turn to God, at least for a time. And there are some contemporary preachers, some of them with television access, I will say, who try to say that this or that natural disaster is God's judgment on the people for some specific sin. I mean, was Hurricane Katrina because the people in New Orleans had a penchant for overindulging on Mardi Gras? Or was the Loma Prieta earthquake because of too many liberal people in the Bay Area? Did the people in Florida just now do something to deserve Hurricane Ian? I know a lot of really nice people from Florida. Because I don't think so. I don't think that's the case. My theology doesn't include this vengeful God using the weather to smite people. I don't see a cause and effect relationship there. Now, should people be turning to God? 
Should we pay more attention to our relationship with God? Absolutely. But not because of fear of judgment or some kind of punishment from God. But I will say this. We ought to be humbled by the awesome power of nature. We think as modern people with all the tools that technology offers that we're somehow in, invulnerable. We can handle all of this. We think that we've conquered the world and all its challenges. But nature often reminds us just how small inconsequential we are. We build a modern city and feel secure in it, but then a hurricane or a tornado or an earthquake or a wild comes along and knocks it to the ground, or worse. And the scary thing to, is that all our attempts to use technology to improve our lives are actually contributing to climate change and our own destruction. We enjoy going to the ocean and looking at the waves. How peaceful, we say, and thank God for the beauty. We lie on the beach soaking up the sun, wait in the tide pool to look at the creatures there. But take a moment to feel the roaring power of those crashing waves. As a pastor and a sometimes sailor, I'm very aware of the power of the ocean. I've been in high winds and high seas, and I know how it can be. I'm always extra careful to read the weather reports and then read the water before I go out. But even then, things can change in an instant. Even something as solid as a mountain can be torn away by nature. I told you I grew up in Washington State. I was living there in 1980 when after about two months of buildup, Mount St. Helens erupted with a 5.1 magnitude earthquake, clouds of ash that covered several states, and the largest landslide in recorded history. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, the debris avalanche that came down the North Fork of the Toodle River was about 3.3 billion cubic yards, the equivalent of one million Olympic swimming pool. Now, after 40 years, you can still see the damage that was done to that area as it's wiped out. People ask, how can someone live in Florida or along the Gulf, or Gulf Coast with the threat of hurricanes? They ask people in the Midwest, how can you live here in Tornado Valley? Have you had people ask you how you can live here in earthquake country? Yeah. I guess pretty much everywhere has their dangers. But what we can do is live in respect of nature and its power. We can make sure our furniture and other items are tethered to the wall where appropriate. We can retrofit our structures so they can survive a major earthquake. All around the bay as I kayak lately, I'm seeing work done to raise the sea walls in advance of the sea level rise. Of course, I wonder if it will be enough, ultimately. This begs the question, how do I live in humility before God? That's where today's lectionary gospel story from Luke 18 comes in. We didn't read it before. We read the Hosea passage. But in the story that's coupled with this, Jesus tells a parable. Two people who go to the temple. One of them was a Pharisee, the other one a tax collector. The Pharisee stands self-righteously and says, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Thieves, rogues, adulterers, even like this tax collector. I fast a tenth of all my income. Meanwhile, the tax collector simply prayed, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said the tax collector was the one who left righteous. And he concluded by saying, all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. Look at me, culture. Humility seems to be a lost art. And I know that sometimes I struggle with this. I, I, I do like to get credit for the things I do. I like it when somebody notices and says thanks. I mean, that's not why I do it, and it shouldn't matter, but I still must admit to wanting some of it. Perhaps the epitome of this these days is in sports, you know, watching the baseball playoffs and the NFL and the NBA is even starting. 
Now every big play is accompanied by gestures, dance moves, sometimes even choreography. You might remember when 49er Terrell Owens pulled a sharp his touchdown ball during a... Several famous football coaches have been credited with the quote, when you get into the end zone, act like you've been there before. Yeah, maybe you've heard that. It takes a great deal of humility to downplay your accomplishments and a lot of confidence. When we're blessed by God, we need to accept it with humility and not some overinflated sense that we richly deserve it or that God is somehow lucky to have us to bless. We don't need to be smug or self-centered in that sense. And I'm looking, I see a lot of really humble people in this room, and there are awesome examples of this. You know, in the real sense, we're the same in God's eyes. I'm going to be closing with this. We're all sinners saved by grace. We're blessed by God, even though we're all undeserving. And that is what makes it all the more wonderful. Joel is famous for his language about the locusts. That is what gets the attention as we first read it. But is even more famous for another part of today's passage. You may remember it from our Pentecost Sunday readings of Acts chapter 2. On that day, after the Holy Spirit came down as tongues of fire, the apostle Peter stood to address the crowd. People from all over the known world just heard the followers of Jesus speaking in many languages, in the tongues of the many nations that were in Jerusalem that day. Peter saw the Spirit of God being poured out on people that day and was reminded of these words from Joel that he quoted in his sermon. Then, afterward, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. and Your young men shall see visions. Even on male and female slaves in those days, I will pour out my spirit. I will show portents in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Because God is faithful for those times when we get wiped out, either by natural disaster or ones caused by humans. God sees beyond that to a time of restoration and care. God sees us through to the day of the Lord. And this inclusive, including vision is for all of us, our sons, our daughters, old, young, rich, poor, and all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So let's look around the room. Look around our neighborhood. We're all in this together. Many of us may live in now, but all of that can change in an instant. Know that all of us together have a future where God's Spirit is poured out on each one of us, where we can live in So we should not think too highly of ourselves, but rather live in gratitude for the grace and care that God affords us. So band, lead us in the song, Humble Yourself in the Sight of the Lord. There's a call and response to this one too, so you can sing the first part, you can sing the echo as they lead us. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. 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 He and He shall lift, shall lift you up higher and higher. And He, and he shall, lift shall lift you up. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. 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 Shall he lift you up higher and higher, and he, and he shall lift, he shall lift you up higher and higher, and, and he shall lift, shall lift you up. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourself in the 
the side of the Lord. Humble yourself in the side of the Lord. Humble yourself in the side of the Lord. And he, and he shall, lift shall lift you up. Higher and higher and he, and he shall, lift shall lift you up. Up unto heaven and he, and he shall lift, shall lift you up. Higher and higher, and he and he shall lift, shall lift you up, up unto heaven, and he and he shall lift, shall lift you up. I'd like to ask the ushers to please come forward to receive today's offering. Greater God, you call us to love and serve you with body, mind, and spirit through loving your creation and our sisters and brothers. Open our hearts in compassion and receive these gifts on behalf of the needs of the church and the world. Amen. Amen. You may please be seated. We come to our time of praying for one another. And just a reminder that if uh, folks can be connected to our United Women in Faith prayer chain, it's a email message that comes um, kind of early Sunday morning often. <laughs> um, but a chance just to read through there and, and the people who have shared prayer requests. We want to be preparing for next Sunday for our I I Remember You service, where we uh, invite people to bring a picture of a loved one to share with people, a chance to kind of spend time just acknowledging our shared grief, a chance for people to uh, reach out to our Stephen ministers who are specially trained lay people 
who can connect one-on-one -on -one with people to kind of talk to them and pray with them through times of trouble. And it's not just limited to this time, but any time throughout the year. Um, it's somewhere between just sharing with a friend and sharing with a counselor or with the pastor, that in-between area where our Stephen ministers can really be of help. And we have some just amazing people who have had special training for that as part of our church. We're going to continue today to do the um, Jesus Remember Me song. This time, each time we will just sing it one time through. So the Jesus Remember Me. So let's use this song as Shane plays uh, to lead us into our time of prayer. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Loving God, we lift up those in our midst who are going through tough times. People who are suffering from illness. People who have required surgery. Families and friends who are grieving the loss of loved ones. People in our community that are going through economic hard times related to the pandemic, related to the economy, related to the inflation and the higher cost of almost everything. Be with those especially affected. We are also mindful of those whose housing is insecure who are facing potential eviction now that some of the moratoriums are being lifted. We ask that you remember our, also our unhoused brothers and sisters as the weather turns cooler, as their lives become even more vulnerable. We ask that you remember them. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And now we lift up the ministry of this church. We pray for our staff, especially for Reverend John, our senior pastor. We pray for our Japanese language division for our English division, for our children, for our middle school and high school youth, for our college students, both at home and away, that you would just continue to watch over and be with them. As we work to minister, both inside our church and reaching out, we pray for opportunities as they come, for upcoming events, like our food distribution, our outreach to the unhoused at St. James Park and other places, for our meal ministry to Casa de Clara, our neighbors, the uh, families that are in transitional housing there, for our trunk and treat event coming up on Halloween, where we welcome literally hundreds of children from this neighborhood to experience the joy and love that comes from our being a community of faith. We thank you that we are able to gather here to be in person, to see people's smiling faces, to share in fellowship after worship, to have a, a cookie or a cup of tea together. And we just pray that you be with each one of us as we seek to live as your people in this time and in this place. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. We invite you to stand for our closing hymn. 
Lord, whose love and humble service. Hear these words of benediction and then go with us to join our brothers and sisters from across the hall as we share in our reception and eat some goodies and have some, some great things. But just know that we are all one congregation living and working together. Go in the love of God to love and serve others. Amen. Amen. Let me show up.